This episode of Yonder with Nick McNutt was a barrel of fun to make. It was also pretty ridiculous. We were aiming to potentially get the first descent of this obscure line that almost never comes into condition. And, and when I was out scoping the line with my drone, turns out there was another group snagging at the same time. So we still went up and skied it the next day. And we actually got it in potentially better condition because there just was some more snow in the gully and the other group before us. Uh, Chris Christie and Paul Greenwood and Eric Carter had set up some of the anchors, so it made it easier for us as well. The interview with Nick is pretty interesting as well. We get into a lot of stuff, a little bit about his accident um, with an avalanche two years ago, as well as what he's interested in for the future of his skiing. He's a professional who's been on snow for a lot of years, and it's always interesting to see how a person like Nick wants to evolve their career after being on top for so many years. There's a little bit of chaos in it, a little scary moment that was one of my least favorite moments in the mountains that I've had recently. And we also talk about his vision for route setting. I'm excited to share this one for you. It was a ton of fun. With your movement into rock climbing and being on the chief hall of the time, how do you sort of see yourself as like an athlete on your different pursuits. You haven't, it doesn't seem like you've tried super hard to make your climbing side of yourself into your professional athlete side. Is that a lack of desire or you just need to go so hardcore into it's rock climbing? It's mostly a lack of skill and strength, yeah. Right. I mean, I, I've, I'm a total middling climber, like very average, you know, mm -hmm. like you look at the grades I climb versus any other average climber out there and I'm probably right in the middle kind right. of and um, you know I think like you get just as much notoriety for establishing moderate climbs mm -hmm. um, often even more than if you establish harder climbs because more people can enjoy them and, and uh, so I think like in that sense it's not really something that I'm going to be like you know some professional climber but it is like by you know by way of being like a full-time ski athlete i think like and you know especially with the north face and everything being heavily involved in climbing it's kind of like a cool opportunity to to be like an average climber in a an amazing destination climbing area and and to be like part of the active climbing community here and you know i know a lot of the better climbers in this town which houses most of the better climbers in north america or in canada you know at least and um that aspect of it I think is kind of cool It's not a huge community but it's pretty big and I think a lot of people do recognize me for like my climbing pursuits as much as skiing like I, I end up bumping into people on the ski resort and they tell me about how much fun they had like climbing this new area I developed or whatever and which is kind of funny because it's not something that I'm necessarily getting it's not like my profession but because I've got the spare time to do it it's kind of like a cool hobby I guess that's like evolved into you know it's like a total passion that that's um it's fun in more ways than one mm -hmm. being able to enjoy other people's climbs and develop my own climbs and see other people enjoy those it feels like kind of giving back and yeah. um Is yeah it, i think it's just it's kind of like a cool a cool way to give back because it, it, with skiing it's not really something i can i can give back necessarily as easily as, as climbing because you know you're not developing ski runs you're not putting up new places to ski maybe you might do a first descent here and there but chances are they're rarely if ever repeated whereas climbing areas are like a resource for the community it's like a, a new trail or something right so mm -hmm. right and it's um and then you, that also brought you a little bit into like setting route when did that sort of start yeah well i had like a an achilles kind of injury that i was dealing with um how did that come about I was skiing and like I, I just uh, it was like one of the last days of the year and I ended up kind of tweaking it and um, I had like a calf muscle strain that kind of evolved into an Achilles strain and it, it just sort of like kept me from being able to really like I got back into biking and stuff but it kept me from really biking and it kept me from climbing much I was kind of like limited I could walk around and stuff but I couldn't really like stand on tiny footholds and I had no calf strength and um, it always kind of like I've been always looking at terrain with like a, a little bit of an eye for like tweaking it to to become like a place that's more fun to play in and you know like when I was younger building bike trails or even with skiing like building jumps and stuff so I always looked around at, at 
features that, you know, looking for kind of like fresh places to go um, and climb. And so I just ended up kind of getting into it as like a means to keep myself busy while I had an injury. It was still something I could do outside and it was kind of like appealing because I could benefit from it later and other people could benefit from it. So. Yeah, it, it's interesting how injury, you can concentrate on the injury, but often in your life, the injury will actually sort of push you to other pieces of development in your character and mm -hmm. like who you are and expand your boundaries. Yeah. Have you noticed that before? Yeah, well, you have two options. You can like, you know, sit there and pout about it and, you know, kind of be self-loathing on the couch or you can modify your activity and, you know, do, do something. Obviously, if you've got two broken legs, you might be pretty couch bound for a little bit. But like yeah. for me, I had, you know, an injury that I could still do some light hiking and, you know, I just couldn't do too much mm -hmm. um, that required a lot of strength, but I could move around. And, and so I could hang in a harness and swing around and I could poke around in the forest and take the dog for a walk and kind of look at weird corners and try and find new terrain. And... Was there any like character change or wisdom that you feel like is attached to the more recent um, accident that you had, the mm. pillow fracture and failure? I think it, I mean, it kind of made me um, a little bit more, I guess, like involved in evaluating like specifics of pillow fields in general and a little bit more aware of like, you know, essentially a pillow is kind of a cornice, like they all, every single pillow in a pillow line is a little bit of a cornice. The way that the snow forms, it always is growing out off of the rock. And so, um, you know, if, if the avalanche forecast is calling for any kind of a cornice hazard, that's going to apply to pillow fields, even if there's not an obvious cornice in there. Right. Um, so like the deeps of winter, it's usually a little bit safer. And, and the one that day was like, it would have been pretty hard to honestly, like even with a fine tooth comb to know that that was ready to go. Such a huge block of snow hung, like, and it was attached by so little, but it does make me just look at things a little bit more closely as far as like the specifics of each pillow that I might be planning on touching. And like, you know, it's, it's really an odds thing to ski pillows. Like they are really complicated terrain and they're full of holes and all the pillows are, questionably attached to little treetops and stuff like you know what's underneath them is always a little bit of a question mark so the nature of skiing them is still always going to be a little bit of a dice roll but just stacking the odds as much as you can in your favor and having mm -hmm. you know maybe less of a terrain trap would have been like one thing too that like looking at that line in hindsight maybe but it's also it's so hard to know yeah, it's you super know. hard when you get into like replaying loops and being like, well, if we change yeah. this factor, where do we go if we change this factor? All of us there that day, honestly, were like still kind of okay with that line as a whole. And especially knowing that like I just skied one just like 100 feet parallel, almost identical mm -hmm. without incident. And it was really had that one pillow not broken off and started rolling, it would have been like a non-event. Um, yeah, because so, you were and it's, you were sticking the line until you got hit by. And the it's pillow. a pillow that I didn't even you know I wasn't even skiing on. It was just like the tiniest little bit of snow touching it. It was a hairpin trigger, right? And it was wrong place, wrong time, really. Yeah. How long have you been actually looking at that line, thinking about trying to ski the chief? It's kind of funny because I feel like I've always looked at a lot of terrain that's kind of in like valley bottom, like sea. Where you know we live at basically sea level here, and like. I've always done this my whole life. Like, imagine there was enough snow that you could ski, that that turned into, like, skiable terrain. Imagine two meters of snow here or here. Mm -hmm. um, and the Chief is a pretty obvious one because it is such an iconic formation, and it's, you know, it's got tons and tons of climbing history, but virtually no ski history. And um, I think it's exceptionally rare for it to be of good enough conditions to bother wanting to even try. And we totally lucked out with that. And, you know, it's, it's kind of funny that it got skied the day before we did it because we were totally talking about it for a few days leading up to it. And I'm sure we weren't the only ones. Like, definitely anyone who's, like, a local kind of ski mountaineer has, has thought, like, wow, imagine that comes into condition. Um, but, you know, I've climbed, like, exactly parallel on the Angel's Crest to that thing, like, countless times. I don't even know how many times I've done that route. And you always look down into the gully and imagine it was full of snow, you know. And there's a few pieces of terrain on the Chief that did seem like kind of appealing to ski. And mm -hmm. that was obviously like the, the kind of plumb line that seemed like the most obvious striking ski line. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the guys who skied it the day before us, it was like, I couldn't imagine a better 
you know, three pack of people to have gone one day before us. It was like exactly who I would expect would be on it. Paul Greenwood, yeah. Eric Carter and Chris Christie. Yeah. And those guys, you know, have like, I mean, Eric wrote the, you know, the, basically the ski map for the Sea to Sky Gondola and those guys have, you know, done basically every trail run circuit you could imagine here. They've skied basically every like obvious ski line around here. Yeah. Um, and they're fit and motivated and they're, yeah knowledgeable and experienced and everything so they had the skill set to do it and it was like pretty obvious that it was going to be those guys who did it first if i had to guess who would be the first mm -hmm. um but it sure made it easy for us to just kind of like follow their you know and we got like pretty detailed rappel beta and it, it filled in a lot more when we skied it i think even just in the one day with all the spin drift coming off of both walls like there was probably yeah. close to twice as much snow the day that we did it compared to when they did it so we ended up having to do fewer repels which is kind of nice like it was probably quite better conditions i would say than when they got it this is super scary i'm on top of this big repel down into the coulee and our rope is frayed on the sheath so i still got all of the core minus one and that means that i should still have somewhere around 90 percent of the strength Jesus. It's desheathing this entire thing. I can't get it to feed through. The repel that I did, which felt super terrifying and yeah. sketchy, because I'm actually trying to go back and think like whether or not my decision making was sound there. Yeah. Um, I don't spend more than like three days on ropes in a year. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not too often around them and I haven't read everything that I should. And normally yeah. I'm just sort of default to uh, the expert in the group on something. But basically to set the stage, I was third person off of this rappel. I rappel to the edge and in my hand, I can feel that the sheath has been uh, like ripped off of both. Yeah. So luckily I'm high enough that I can do a really, really ghetto job of hacking my way back up to the anchor. And then when I talk to you, you say that the interior strands of it are gonna hold 90% of the strength of it, so long as they're not, so long as I don't have extra fraying issues that I should yeah. be fine with what I did. Because the trouble that I'm thinking for me is from that point going back up, I actually would totally be able to just boot pack my way out of the chief. And for me, it felt, when it happened that the D sheath part of the rope continued to extend so instead of only showing like one yeah, foot once of it's rope caught, it kind of like it can slide through your device and get longer yeah it was sliding through the device so i had like almost a meter and a half of exposed um core core yeah and i'm sort of feeling like in that moment i'm fully trusting what you're saying so that's why i made the decision that i did but Above me, I could have just walked out of the couloir, and then when I, I got mean, walked, <laughs> it would have it would have been hours and hours of like yeah battling. But, but com compared to yeah. what I was, and we did one rappel at the top, which would have been a problem to hack your way back up. I think it would have been kind of a pain. It would have it been, been possible. It would have been very possible with the trees yeah. that were around there. Like I could have got out of there with an ice axe. But the them. other the other thing to consider was that the other members of the group were below which was a significant rappel, unclimbable. Yeah, and then I would have been soloing. There was also the factor of like possibly needing the rope further down because we were told there was five rappels and we were fortunate that there was like quite a bit more snow. We ended up not doing any more rappels on that mm -hmm. rope, but the way that the rope was compromised was like of the absolute least convenient way. Like it was, the rope was in thirds essentially, right? Where the core shots were. There was two core shots, like 10 meters from the center of the rope. Yeah on a climbing rope 
the sheath is the exterior that you see that's yeah. woven together that has colors that are matching each other. Inside of that, you have the core uh, strands. What do you call them? Core. Yeah, and that and they're they're what like keeps the integrity of the rope. And the sheath is essentially what protects the core, right? So the core is where the strength of the rope comes from, yeah. and the sheath is there to take the abrasion, you know, it can be like often frayed or fuzzy or, mm -hmm. and it, it keeps, um, when they're dry treated, it will keep like water off the core of the rope. So it, it ends up being what protects the core. The core is a strength and obviously it's not ideal to have the core exposed on a rope, but in the situation we were in mm -hmm. at that moment, it did seem like if the core was intact and you were careful, like you ended up modifying where you repelled so that, you know, the core of the rope like the section that was compromised was we had redirected the rappel so you were you know not free hanging on a sharp edge on that core it was now moved into a different section and yeah um so you haven't gone through and replayed it and checked whether or not like whether or not we made the right call i just sort of was feeling a bit after that like i defaulted to trust in you but then mm. also i think that i also was just like sort of excited about the idea of the rappel yeah and then when i got lower in the core i was like actually that rappel was very terrifying i was yeah. above like the slough had the slough that was moving through that part meant that uh the rocks were more exposed. I don't yeah. know if you saw that because you were so much lower, mm -hmm. but if I had a fall there, it would have been really, really graphic. Yeah. Um, where if I had fallen on other snow, you're just falling on snow and you can yeah. probably get away with maybe a broken limb at worst. But where I was, I was like, that was really messed up. Like I, yeah. I so I've been sort of replaying that one and I wanted to verbally process it because it, um, it was one of the more terrifying things that I've personally been, like the person who is in danger on. Yeah. Um, like having a fear go to 10 out of 10 for a little bit there was not a common experience. Yeah. And then just the retrospect side of it, I'm like, I don't. So I yeah. appreciate thinking it over again. It makes me feel better about the fact that we had trusted that and went to that choice. I think too, like part of that fear comes from like an unfamiliarity with the equipment and also just like, I mean, it's the same kind of fear that someone would feel their first time ever top roping a rock climb. And then they're, you know, they get to the top of the anchor and then now it's like, oh, I have to wait this rope and get lowered off. And you see people freeze up and you see people like mm -hmm. not wanting to let go of the rock, like they have just zero trust for the equipment. And I mean, obviously, yes, the rope was for sure compromise like at that point it's not a rope you're going to take out in the field again no but in that moment it was the rope that we had and you know the fact that the core was intact you know in an ideal world maybe we would have used some tape to kind of like cover the core back up or something and protect it further but it was kind of that last yeah i didn't have any tape yeah and it was also like it at that point, the, the tape is like for your own peace of mind. It's not actually making the rope stronger, you know. <laughs> like, um, but there's t like countless stories of people in the mountains and their rope gets core shot and they got to just deal with it. And it's, you know, until the core is compromised substantially, it's like if the sheath is gone, like you're just more careful with it. And putting it through a device on a free hanging rappel is obviously like tricky when, you know, the sheath is getting kind of grabbed and pulled. And it was... It's not ideal. It's not ideal at all. But have you done, have you had that experience before putting the, like on a free hanging rappel, putting a core shot I've, rope through? Yeah, I've had some core shot ropes over the years oh, okay. on like, you know, when you have multiple rappels to do and stuff and something happens, like it doesn't take much to core shot a rope. Yeah. Um, and obviously, as we saw, it didn't take much. Like it was essentially, I think what happened was Peter must have had like a little bit of a horizontal movement as he turned that lip and it was quite sharp. And that was like, you know, sharp enough to yeah. really do some damage on the rope. And then the fact that it was free hanging immediately after, like your whole body weight's fully in the air and the rope had slipped a little bit or something, like it, it just didn't yeah. take a lot, right? It's like as if you ran an edge of a knife over. And, um, and the thing was too, that there was like a bit of ice over the lip and a bit of snow. And so when I went, it seemed like it was, you know, I kind of looked for the best place to repel and it seemed like the plum line was made the most sense so that so that the rope wouldn't move mm -hmm. after I was already over the lip like being directly below the anchor seemed like the best spot um, and maybe just being one foot over or something when he went and then it slipped to the position mm -hmm. um, that's all it took and yeah going third kind of sucks in that <laughs> moment <laughs> there's 
still a taboo in snow culture about being involved in avalanches. Um, it can carry shame with it. Um, and then also just the experience, it seems, I've never been buried of going through a burial is extremely severe and can be a complete life altering experience. Mm. And the people who are around you, they can always feel like they're going to rescue you, but you down there on the bottom side are dealing with mortality. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a weird space. Um, and for me, it was like, it was kind of a weird way to resurface because like, the first thing that happened as soon as I was able to start breathing was like, well, a wave of pain because of my badly broken arm, but then also having like Ian McIntosh basically yell, yell at me like, your fucking beacon wasn't on, you know, like, and hearing that like as soon as I can breathe was like, oh my god, a little bit of a weird experience. And then, and but like, and then, you know, so then you're just cold and you're in pain and you're dealing with the rescue, but like the immediate afterward, like conversation and turned to like, what the hell happened with this transceiver? And, you know, the fact that there's seven of us there and all seven of us are like 100% confident that thing was on. Mm -hmm. um, it triggered like this investigation, which, you know, as we know now, like all this time later, the device was faulty. For the greater good of the backcountry community, I think like it, it really redirected my focus, like pretty much right away. Mm -hmm. um, and I had nothing but time because COVID, essentially I was in the hospital for four days and COVID shut everything down the day I got out of the hospital is when it like all started to happen. This was March of 2020. So between like everything kind of hitting pause as far as everyone else's ski seasons and stuff, like resorts closing everything. And then, um, having nothing but time. Cause I was just sitting on the couch. Um, it, it really like kind of sucked my attention a little bit away from like the actual experience mm -hmm. of being buried. And, um, I feel like I have a relatively calm mind, you know, even like climbing has trained me a little bit for that because like if you're, you know, cl anyone who's like gone lead climbing essentially knows like that kind of battle of talking yourself into continuing on in a dangerous situation and like remaining calm and controlling your breathing and all that. So when I was under there, it was essentially like, you know, I'm with these six other people who are highly trained experts who are all super close, saw it all happen. Like it's going to be okay. You're buried you're like at the mercy of what happens, but like they have it under control. And obviously I didn't know that my transceiver wasn't like sending a signal out at that point, but that part of it, like knowing that I was with such strong team members and how close they were and everything, like I knew that it was going to be a very short amount of time that I was buried and like they were coming. Mm -hmm. So that really helped um, my headspace under there. Yeah. And I was like a little bit, almost too calm at the end, I'd say like when the probe actually did hit me, that was like a re-alerting of all the senses and like the panic started again. But, um, I was kind of like, had calmed myself down so much that I was like falling asleep, mm -hmm. which you don't necessarily want in that situation. But, yeah. um, I think honestly, like some of them, especially Christina, maybe a, like, a couple of them had probably worse mental trauma than I did from the experience. Cause mm -hmm. Yeah, like I said, as soon as I got out of there, I had like an injury to deal with, um, which was really distracting from the burial and then the transceiver thing and everything. So there was a lot going on. Yeah. Are there tools, methods, books, processes that you found useful for working through the traumatic side of mm -hmm. a mountain incident? I think like I spent a lot of time talking, mm -hmm. just being like open and vocal about it. I think, um, you know, at first with close people, but then also like, you know, moving on to like the podcast kind of space and just being like active online to try and spread the message of the, the device and everything. Like I, I was never really keeping it to myself. Mm -hmm. I think like being able to talk through that makes a big difference because as soon as you're, you're quiet and you're not, you know, if it's all internalized, um, it's got nowhere to go, but to like, kind of boil over I think at some point and, and maybe cause you some issues but just being able to openly talk about it I never felt like I needed to necessarily go to like a therapist or anything about it because I wasn't you know it didn't take much prying for me to just speak about it right um, so I think that was had, had I been like a little bit more hesitant to like talk about it or it was more triggering you know I'd say like 
some therapy would probably have been really smart. But I was, you know, I was never really, the only time I really cried about it was like the first time I, I saw the footage with like the audio, because we we're wearing microphones. And so hearing like the audio of myself under there and seeing it happen and then seeing everyone else's panic, like and hearing the panic, mm -hmm. um, that teared up for sure. But otherwise, like, you know, and that, I didn't see it until probably four or five months later. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, it was a little bit more just like disbelief, I'd say, like, you know, between the injury and then like what happened with the device was like, it was a little bit more of like disbelief and like kind of a, I was like upset, you know, like I wasn't really like shattered emotionally for personal reasons because of the burial. I was more just like mad that that, that could happen. And then like obviously learning that it had already happened to other people and other people had died from this exact same issue, like from the device turning off and stuff. It just like was upsetting and, and it kind of drove like a, a need for action on it. I'd yeah. say, and knowing that, like, you know, between me and the people there, we had like a pretty significant following in the backcountry skiing space that we could, yeah. you so, know, not necessarily blackmail the brand into to doing the right thing, but like telling them, like, look, you've got until, you know, basically, like, this film is coming out, and we're not going to keep this quiet when people ask questions, and like, this is going to be a problem for you, like, giving them six months to do their due diligence and testing and, and you know, speak to the community. And then, yeah, the rest is already written, written in history that they're kind of blowing it, to be honest. I would be more affected emotionally being a rescuer than a victim. And maybe that's different mm -hmm. depending on who you are, but I can sympathize with like how traumatic that would be to be, especially your significant other. Yeah. And, and knowing like that helplessness feeling like that must have existed, I can only imagine mm -hmm. to be like seriously traumatic and, and rattling and life altering. Yeah, no one really gets out of it. If you're there, you're really yeah, part of you're it. You're hands on, you're yeah. involved. And, you know, survivor's guilt is a real thing, like knowing that that, you know, had it not gone the same way, like, you know, there's been documented cases of people who just couldn't handle that survivor's guilt, right? And yeah. that self blame and it's a real thing. Yeah. And knowing like, you know, the decisions that you or your group may have made that day led to the situation. It's like always, you know, what could we have done differently? What did we do wrong? What should we have done instead? Like that narrative probably is really hard to keep under control and to, to put a cap on. I yeah. can only imagine, right? I know we went through that as a group and... Yeah, well, like we went through our debriefing things and then I've also tried to evaluate. It's like, well, which, like, you could think of which like physical course changes could affect a different thing, but I'm more interested in like what are the different behavioral changes or attitude changes that mm -hmm. potentially can make you sensitive to those issues. And that's been um, interesting to try to work through because there are sort of like, uh, well, there are professionals who specifically look at this kind of thing and yeah. they'll have their own both like theories and uh, best practices for all of these. And then I can have my own ideas around ways things, could, yeah. way you could manipulate things. And I'm still sort of trying to chat with different professionals over time about how they perceive things. Um, one of the like more interesting ones you've worked with Zahan Bilhor Bilamara. Yeah, Bilamaria, I think his last name is. Just call him Z. Z. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's I was awesome. Chatting with him, and he offers like he's sort of in a different sphere of mountain safety because he's been trying to work with media and trying to... He's a high-level guide, right? And, well, and But he's like high-level guide, but he's not just like a mechanized or not just no. a ACMG. Well, and he's an athlete too, obviously, and, and he's... But working with it. media and the, like, the influences that media and lenses have on the environment around you. Mm -hmm. And one of the main pieces of wisdom that I thought was actually quite interesting was that he was articulating how important it is to curate like the right vibe or the right energy with a crew mm -hmm. where um, if people are fully feeling valued and comfortable in a group that they're skiing with, that information flow can work better in all directions. Mm -hmm. 
that it can break down any sense of hierarchy and that you can be sensitive to information coming from any side. And that's one aspect that I thought was super interesting of like, how do you curate vibe? Like, how do you make sure that people are interested in like communicating their fears? Um, especially when like as snow, snow professionals were switching group very frequently. Yeah. So from any day to another, you can be skiing with people that you've never met before. Um, and it's been interesting to try to concentrate on that because it seems like a valuable piece of wisdom and advice to be carrying forward. Yeah. Um, to, because I know that I've experienced being in a group where I didn't feel like I would, should be the person talking. I was sort of like an external to a group that already has its like method and like the language that they speak in, the humor that they like. Yeah. And it's a, yeah. Had you come across that conversation with Z ever before? Well, it's kind of like, you know, it's in the classic learning of, you know, avalanche safety to, you know, avoid that expert halo, we mm -hmm. call it, where it's, you know, you have essentially a kind of a group leader who may or may not be actually the best person to be making decisions for the group. Maybe they're the best skier mm -hmm. in the resort or whatever. Maybe they're the most talented actual skier, but that doesn't necessarily correlate to making the right decisions for a group. And then having someone who, you know, maybe they just finished taking their like Abbey one and they don't feel like they have, you know, the space to be able to raise a concern about a terrain choice or a plan or whatever. And they just kind of defer to this person who might be the expert just because they're the best skier, or maybe they've been going for a, a season more in the back end or something. And I think that's like a really, really important thing to be mindful of in any group to, to really treat everyone's opinion as valid and useful information. And, you know, everyone's got their own set of senses, but often that expert might not be making the, the right decision for the entire group. And if any one person in the group has a problem with the plan, it should never be just like brushed, uh, brushed aside because of lack of experience. Like there's a reason why that person feels that way. And, you know, if maybe they're wrong and they're just inexperienced and they're timid, that's all right. But, you know, the, the, the plan for the group might have to be modified because of that for that day. And maybe that's something that you can talk about later. Like, why did we end up backing off? And if everyone else in the group feels like it was a fine idea, but this person just maybe is a little bit timid, you shouldn't push that person forward. You should listen to them and respect their, their mm -hmm. feeling. And, um, you know, the last thing you want to do is just blindly have faith in someone who is just a stronger skier than you in a backcountry situation where, you know, you're relying on your own group for safety. And mm -hmm. if that person, the expert in the group happens to be the one who gets buried that day and the inexperienced people were raising concerns and they were ignored, like, you know, the situation can get pretty ugly pretty quick. So, so then with all of these different sides of like pursuits that you're into skiing, biking, rock climbing, route setting, um, you could go towards more backward ski, more alpinism, like you sort of have a very wide skill set at this point. What are you like the most interested in pursuing professionally in like this season or the coming years? Mm, I think, I mean, still like skiing powder, basically like backcountry freestyle powder skiing and, you know, doing, doing kind of like a bit more of a freestyle element in like a bigger mountain setting is still the most fun thing for me. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's really like pure fun. Um, but I do like the kind of type two aspect fun too at times, you know, I like having like a good story at the end and, um, really memorable experiences in the mountains. And I think like going rock climbing is really fun, but also going like, you know, kind of alpine climbing. I find it's like really rewarding. Um, I've had some amazing experiences doing like some of these classic moderate long, like destination alpine routes and stuff and you know spending time like in the bugaboos or mm -hmm. on washington pass or like just being in the alpine is really fun in all conditions summer or winter i think it's like it's a really special place to be because it feels like you're really like you know a little bit at the mercy of the elements but you're also like kind of playing amongst mm -hmm. the big mountains which is it's kind of cool yeah um and i think like ski mountaineering is like a pretty natural evolution of that as i age out of wanting to jump off of as big of stuff. I think like with the climbing background and the, you know, 
the alpine background and, and the skiing background, I think it's like kind of a natural place to transition towards maybe doing bigger objectives in the, in the mountains, like with skis. Yeah. Um, but I'm not in a rush to, and like, you know, when it comes up and it seems fitting, I'm, I'm happy to do that stuff, but it's not necessarily a priority for me yet. I think like, I'm still like physically feeling like I can, I can still like play like a kid in the mountains, which yeah. I want to milk that for as long as I can. Cause it's kind of the most like pure joy that I, I can get in yeah. life. I feel like it's really just like unfiltered type one fun makes you smile and makes you laugh. And you know, it's those, those runs are like just on the ski hill in deep snow are like kind of some of the best times you'll have in life. So mm -hmm. I do like that after all of the ridiculous sides of some of the stuff that we do that you still actually come back to thinking that the like it's not heli skiing it's not cat skiing it's not sled skiing it's actually like the most joyful and like perfect version is actually like a good storm day on the resort with a couple of buddies i mean midweek when you can just get on the lift mm -hmm. and there's like just no hassle you yeah. can just and it's kind of that pure hot lapping fun like that's that's as good as it gets when you're cat skiing too you know like you're or heli skiing like you're you're just like hot lapping with friends laughing at the good conditions. And if you can get that on just like a chairlift, mm -hmm. like it doesn't get any easier, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then you don't have this sort of guilt of like the fossil fuel aspect of it all and all that, but it's, yeah. um, it's just, or just the fun. stress of it, like using totally. a heli. It's like, yeah. it's and snowmobiling is like, it's logistically challenging a lot, you know, yeah. and you spend a lot of time getting stuck and unstuck and <laughs> retrieving machines and, you know, taking a lap where you're just the driver this time and all like, you just lose all that. Everyone just gets in the lift, you rest for 10 minutes together and then you do it again. And it's like kind of as fun as it gets. Yeah. Um, that was fun, man. Yeah. Um, thanks for making the time and thanks for keeping me safe on the chief. Yeah, no problem. Sorry. Sorry about the core shot rope propel. That was like, yeah, when you phoned me, cause we were not quite within earshot, yeah. it was like, you know, I actually like hung up for a second and like, just like thought about it and yeah. just the way that specific time, like, I mean, there's other ways you can get around dealing with a core shot rope, but our specific situation with having like the rope essentially in thirds. Yeah. Like, well, it was like, it made it really complicated to do without just like, you know what? It's just like, put the rope in a different spot and just be really careful. <laughs> like at that point, like, I don't know. It's yeah. And the strength of the rope was uh -huh. there. It's definitely gripping though, to be able to see in the core of the rope as you're repelling. If this episode had ideas that you thought were important, please send it to a friend or subscribe and like below.